Yes, okay. Um, all right, we're going to begin. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I, um, I'm the chair of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the moment, and therefore I have the honor of, uh, of hosting you all tonight and of welcoming our guests as well. Uh, what I, so tonight's event is, carries the title of, uh, of Vince Raphael's paper called Humanizing the Inhuman, Photographing Death in Duterte's Drug War. Uh, what I will do is first introduce Vince Raphael, our speaker, and then we will show a short film, and then we will have a panel of respondents, and I will introduce the respondents at that moment after, after Vince's talk. So here, here goes. So uh, Vince Raphael is the Giovanni and Anne Costigan Endowed Professor of History at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, he is the author of several works, I will name a few of them here, um, both very well known in Southeast Asian studies, I should say, um, Contracting Colonialism, White Love and Other Events in Filipino History, and The Promise of the Foreign and Motherless Tongues, The Insurgency of Language Amid Wars of Translation, uh, many other things bubbling around, but I'll, I'll leave it at that um, so that we have enough, ta enough time to listen to uh, Vince's recent work. And um, let me uh, tell you about this film. It's a very short eight minutes. It intersects, shall we say, with the photographic materials that Vince will be addressing uh, in his talks. So we thought it might be worthwhile to set the scene um, as we transition to the talk. So this is a film called Duterte's Hell by Aaron Goodman and Luis Lewanag. It was the first prize winner of the World Press Photo Award for Digital Storytelling. So we'll move on to that then and then on to Vince. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Ashley, for that warm introduction. Uh, Christina Juan for inviting me. You're the one, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks to you, uh, Philippine studies seems to have had a renewed spark uh, in SOAS. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the film is actually quite an interesting setup. Uh, I have more to say about the film towards, if you want to, I mean, I actually have something to say about the film, but towards the Q&A, because the film came out after I had written this paper. So I have like, and the paper itself I have a long footnote. So if you, you want to sort of discuss, discuss this, that would be, that would be fine too. Uh, so let me start uh, so that we could, we could get the show on the road. Um, uh, this is the second half of a much longer paper, the first half of which I gave yesterday, and the second half the first half concentrates on the sort of the rhetoric and the politics of the drug war. This one concentrates more on the sort of representational uh, sort of uh, uh, aspect uh, of the drug war, uh, which which I think, as I said, uh, ties up nicely with with the film. Uh, on May 22, 2015, uh, while yet to declare his candidacy for the presidency, uh, then. Uh, Davao Mayor Rodrigo Duterte spoke about his intention to kill as many drug addicts as, uh, and pushers as possible. Often, he was given to addressing them directly as a you. The, uh, I addressing as a you. Let me see if this works. Yeah. If I became president, you all should die. Uh, and this idea of direct address is itself very interesting. It's almost as if he identifies. Uh, with the addicts that he's addressing. It's almost as if the I is substitutable with the U, and I can come back to that later, uh, later on if you want. Uh, the 1,000 killed in Davao City, it will reach 50,000. I would kill all of you who make the lives of Filipinos miserable. Uh, I will definitely kill you. I will win because of the breakdown in law and order. I do not want to commit this crime, but if by chance God will place me there, stay on guard because that 1,000 will become 100,000. So he's also given to hyperinflation. You can tell. Uh, you will see the fish in Manila Bay becoming fat. This is where I will dump you all. Since becoming president a year later, Duterte has returned obsessively to this theme. No matter what occasion or audience, he cannot help but bring up the drug war and his eagerness for annihilating its alleged perpetrators. For example, when addressing the country's most prominent business leaders, the Makati Business Club, uh, he offered the basic template for his drug policy. It's going to be bloody. 
I will use the military and the police to go out and arrest them, hunt them, and if they offer any resistance, uh, uh, and thereby placing the lives of the law enforcers and the military, whom I would task for the job to do, I will simply say, kill them all and end the problem. Now, since taking his office, President Duterte has assiduously pursued this war on addicts. The number of the dead keep rising, whether one goes by the police estimate of nearly 4,000 or those of various human rights groups, which range from a high of 20,000, most of them in the slums of the metro Manila region. Sheila Coronel, the journalist, vividly describes this landscape of death. Quote, the victims' bodies are found on sidewalks or bridges, their heads wrapped in packing tape, their hands bound with rope. Uh, some, are, some are left lying on the streets, uh, uh, bathed in blood, or splayed in, on the shaky wooden floors or shacks in shanty towns along the river and the shoreline of Manila Bay, or further inland in the densely packed warrens inhabited by the city's poorest and neediest. Such scenes of nightly killings have been amply documented by various photographers and journalists, both foreign and Filipino. From July of 2016 uh, until about the early 2018, which is about the time period I'm going to talk about, uh, because things have changed since January of 2018, and again I can talk about that later on, a small but dedicated group of correspondents known as the night crawlers for the late hours they keep have been going from one crime scene to another to take photographs and write stories about the victims and their families. Serving on the front lines of the drug war, they have witnessed the bloody toll of Duterte's necropolitics. Thanks to their work, photographs and stories of the dead and their families have circulated wild, widely around the world, showing viewers the extent of the regime's brutality. In what follows, I want to ask about the complex nature and ambivalent effects of their photographic work. I want to start by looking at the experience of the photojournalists themselves <clears throat> as they come into the crime scene. In various interviews, they often speak of being overwhelmed by what appears before them. What they see often outstrips when they could possibly know, much less talk about. Experience and expression are torn apart, the latter exceeding the former. Carlo Gabuco, for example, says, there's always a moment of disbelief whenever we go into a crime scene and I see the victim for the first time, see how they suffered at the hands of their killers. From Alex Ann Arumpak, recently I've been having many breakdowns and I'm wondering why I'm always crying but then I realized as well, actually, this is bigger than me. This is not about me. And Dondi Tawatao remarks, you really think about what those images might do to you. It was only later around November that I felt ill. At one point, all my dreams were about crime scenes. I was about to check myself into a hospital because I was having coughing fits. We lost something here in the drug war. I am still grappling with what it is we lost. Faced with the scene of the crime, Photojournalists are struck with disbelief and confusion. They apprehend more than they can comprehend, and so don't exactly know what to think about what they are experiencing. This radical gap between what one experiences and one's ability to narrate it is usually referred to as trauma. A chasm opens up between what happened and one's ability to make sense uh, uh, of it, as in, for example, accidents. This failure to conceptualize what one sees and feels results in being struck numb or ill for days on end. One replays the experience rather than finds a way to frame it and set it aside. Trauma, by making speech difficult, if not impossible, compels instead the repetition of the event rather than its representation. In a traumatized state, one is unable to distance oneself from what one has gone through, and so one, one finds oneself divided against uh, oneself. Unable to judge, much less think rationally, one is contaminated by the, what one sees and forced to relive its violence again and again. A nagging sense of loss persists, made worse by the fact that one is uncertain as to what exactly was lost. Arising from a crisis of experience, Trauma disables photojournalists from doing what they are supposed to do, cover the event by rendering, them, by, by rendering it into the true account of what actually happened. This disability, however, is only temporary. Subsequent interviews with photojournalists show a pattern for dealing with trauma and recovering what was lost. In a society where therapeutic practices for dealing with trauma are largely absent or inaccessible to all but the wealthiest, Dealing with trauma comes in different ways. 
In the case of the night crawlers, they speak about fostering a strong sense of camaraderie. Unlike other professional journalists who may compete to outscoop one another for a story, those covering the drug war talk about the deep horizontal ties, analogous to that of veteran soldiers who had fought through many battles, feeling as if they were part of what they call a mutually supportive tribe. But while important, such friendships require something else, a, a supplement, as it were, that might allow the traumatized self to recover. This entails reconceiving oneself not simply as a passive observer, but more important as an active witness to the events that it covers. <clears throat> the acts of witnessing converts the photographer's work into testimonies of injustice. But in the process of witnessing, photographers invariably do something else. They turn to the survivors of the victims and join them in the labor of mourning their loss. Witnessing as a cure for trauma is then retrospectively associated with friendship and grieving alongside the practice of truth-telling in the face of extrajudicial killings. Witnessing, mourning, and truth-telling are thus related moments in the emergence of the photographer from his or her initial state of confusion and paralysis. In the context of Duterte's narco and necro obsessions, such moments as I hope to show assume considerable significance. It is to these uh, processes that I now want to turn to. When asked why they do what they do, photojournalists invariably respond with some variation of their responsibility to report what they see on behalf of those who have no voice and for the benefit of those who other otherwise remain blind to events. They are, in this sense, witnesses using their photographs and stories as documents in pursuit of justice for the sake of those unable to do so. For this reason, photojournalists claim to be driven by a categorical imperative to do what is right for those who have been wronged. As moral agents, they act as witnesses for the victims of their families. This process, this process of witnessing entails seeing their photographs as more than what they are not simply as a collection of images, but as artifacts saturated with meaning. Indeed, the responsibility, as they understand it, begins by being able to look beyond appearances, to see photographic images uh, as necessary, but ultimately dispensable means of getting at something like truth and justice. How is this possible? Right? So because for them, their art is not art for, it's never art for art's sake. It's always for a purpose. It's always for a reason. How is this possible? How does one move from taking photographic images to espousing moral ideals, given that photography is precisely about the conversion of reality into appearances? How does the, photo, how does the photographer go from becoming a technician who captures images to an advocate for the subjects of his or her photographs? And who are these subjects, especially the dead victims captured on camera without their knowledge or their consent? What is the relationship between the photographer, the corpse, and their survivors as they appear before the camera? What role does the camera itself play as a technological and therefore non-human apparatus for documenting the dehumanizing effects of war? What is the place of the camera in the formation of the photographer's sense of his or her? or her own humanity predicated on his or her moral agency. Now, as I mentioned earlier, photographers think of themselves as witnesses. Becoming a witness, however, does not happen automatically. It comes in the wake of their initial shock at, the ar at arriving at the scene of the crime. To become witnesses, they need to interview other witnesses to the crime. This is because, as Jess Asnar tells Vice News, Journalists are forbidden from accompanying the police during operations. Quote, we only get to cover the event after the fact, when there's a dead body, after the gunfights, close quote. To get the story, they need to ask the people in the area whom they have, uh, who, who may have witnessed the killing. Funeral parlors are particularly helpful since they are among the first to know uh, if there is a body to be picked up. And this is because cops and funeral parlor parlors have a, an arrangement. Uh, cops call in a dead body and then they get a commission in return. Uh, and this is partly because there is no city morgue in Manila, and so all the bodies get to be delivered in private funeral parlors. Uh, and, and there's a whole monetary sort of aspect to this that, again, I can talk about at the end. So they'll call us, the funeral parlors, or text us and say, hey, there's a dead body in this area. We're going to be going there to pick up the body. Police are interviewed along with neighbors, bystanders, and family members when they are not too distraught to talk. In short, 
journalists and photographers can only become witnesses by talking with other witnesses. Their telling grows out of a series of other tellings as they become a link in a chain of witnessing. As witnesses to other witnesses, photographers are twice or thrice removed from their narrative. However, unlike their stories, their, their photographs are able to capture images of the first and the last witness to the death of the victim. And this is the body of the victim itself. Some of the most arresting and oft reproduced images of the drug war are those of the corpses, as you saw in the video as well. Based in the light of street lamps and police cars, corpses appear as the most dramatic manifestations of the drug war. They testify to the violence of the regime as they represent the fulfillment of the Turtas' most cherished wish of annihilating addicts. Indeed, this is the point of wrapping many of them in packing tape and leaving cardboard signs, pusher ako, wag tularan. I am a pusher, do not imitate me. Displayed in public, they are meant by the police to be discovered by the people in the media. The corpses become texts, testifying to the power of the state not only to get rid of those it considers socially dead, but also to extract their capacity to access a realm beyond the living. Thus is the corpse indentured to serve as a sign for the state's ability to overcome and appropriate the power of criminality for itself. Bound, packaged, and labeled with signs, the victims displayed remains the, the victims displayed remains are reduced into instruments with which to enact and transmit the will of the state. <clears throat> it is a familiar tactic, as old as public crucifixions hangings and the display of decapitated heads on spikes along the roadways from classical antiquity to the early modern period. The body of the Shabu addict is the figure which, as Giorgio Agamben might say, can be killed but whose death would, not amount, would amount neither to murder nor sacrifice. The exposure of the corpse to public view is a way of including what has been excluded by the state. It marks not just the boundary that separates the social from the antisocial, the corpse, from the perspective of the state, is a concentrated point from which radiates sovereign power. It is thus used as a stage to display the basis, the very basis of state power itself, which is the power to kill, from which comes the sovereign's power to keep others alive. But is this the only way the corpse can serve as a witness? <clears throat> is it simply a prop for announcing the terrible power of the state? Or does it also function in ways that can undercut the state's claim to instill fear? Do the, photo, do, do the photographs of the corpse also bring out a different and more unsettling power? The images and accounts of photojournalists indicate a different relationship to the dead. The strange agency of the corpse, its capacity to testify to its demise and act upon the world in the process of having escaped from it, is evident in various interviews. For example, here are two remarkable stories of encountering corpses told by one of the most famous photojournalists in Manila, Rafi Lerma. So two stories. Let's show the first one. This is the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's some more grisly pictures. More grisly pictures. Uh, so here's the story of Rafi Lerma. <clears throat> Quote, it was my second night on the night shift, and I remember this as something that had a real impact on me. There was another extrajudicial killing, a body wrapped in packing tape. When the police were cutting the tape, unfortunately, I was using my zoom lens and was focusing on the face. When the tape was removed, I saw the expression on the face. He was staring at me. His mouth was open. I was terrified, really terrified, because it was like I felt his last moments, <clears throat> how he died, like he was gasping for air, the feeling you get when you're being buried alive, that at first you lose all light, then all air. I felt that for it, so for a time, I didn't take any more photos like that. Or if it's an extrajudicial killing, I don't focus my, my camera on the faces. The sight of the corpse simultaneously invites and repels the gaze of the photographer. And I'm assuming it looked something like this, because this was a photograph he himself took. <clears throat> At once living and dead, it is as much a compelling object as an impossible subject of photographic interest. It appears as something that is on its way to disappearing. As the materialization of death's arrival, the body of the victim is the something becoming nothing that nonetheless continues to be in the world. 
It exercises an uncanny power as it occupies the radically undecidable border between the living and the dead. As such, it is the embodiment of the inhuman in two senses. One, as a recipient of a deadly force, and secondly, as an envoy of what remains outside of the social. It is precisely the uncanny power that confronts Lerma. Seeing the face of the corpse emerging from the packing tape, he is seized with terror. He sees on its face, quote, its last moments. Its expression, mouth open as if gasping for air, testifies to its ongoing disappearance. What is the source of the horror here? Perhaps it has something to do with seeing the corpse's face and realizing how different it is from ours, the living. Usually when we look at the face of an other, we expect to see something similar to our own, a sort of mirror that reflects our humanity. As James Siegel, the anthropologist, shows in his reflections on the German philosopher Georg Simmel, the face is often regarded in westernized cultures as the locus of expression, concealing and revealing the soul the soul understood as the energy and rationality of the person. Hence, is the face capable of conveying so much with so little, showing anger, for instance, with the knitting of the brows, or joy with the simple turn of the lips. The most important parts of the face that enables it to convey a sense of intersubjective humanity are, of course, the eyes. Hence, the cliché that the eyes are the windows of the soul, just as they are organs for taking in appearances and indicating the workings of the mind. Right? Which is why when you see somebody who is blind or is cross-eyed, the first thing you think of is, you know, maybe there's something wrong with this person, right? Because you expect there to be a connection between the sharpness of the gaze and the active workings of the mind behind it. Simmel distinguishes between the eyes on the human face and those found on the painted portraits common in Western art. The latter function like mechanical eyes, he says. It sees only what Simmel calls pure appearances, making no distinction between, for example, the leg of a chair and that of a child. He says, uh, the mechanical eye merely sees appearances. It penetrates, it withdraws, it circles a room, it wanders. It reaches as though behind the wanted object and pulls it toward itself. The power to take in appearances without regard to distinctions or interpretations is, of course, inherent in the eye of the camera. It is a kind of technological eye that surpasses the human eye in its ability to zoom in and out, focus and unfocus on details and panoramas, capture subtle gradations of light and dark. But despite the fact that it can do so much more than what the human eye can, the camera's eye cannot synthesize or understand what it sees. It cannot edit and delete par parts to form holes, and so cannot judge the images that it takes. It registers images promiscuously, but divorces these from interpretation and meaning. The human eye, however, moves in the opposite direction. To see is invariably to interpret and make sense, hence the term I see. Hence, the human eye must censor and repress, include and exclude, framing images to highlight some while leaving others out. We can only see selectively, blocking out certain images in favor of others in order to comprehend what we apprehend. Doing so allows us to see distinctions and the limits of form, that is, to see the aesthetic qualities of images. And by grasping the forms of what appears before us, we are able to judge them. It is this faculty of judgment that allows us to become moral agents, telling apart what is beautiful and good from what is not. Blindness is thus the price of insight. Our vision is humanized insofar as it is founded on the ability to take on and seize hold of the autonomous and inhuman power of the camera's mechanical eye. Rather than succumb to the amoral power of the mechanical eye, however, we find ways to tame it and put it under our control, thereby aestheticizing what we see. Our capacity to see as humans is thus predicated on our ability to contain, in both senses of that word, the power of the inhuman mechanical eye. It is the rigorous domestication of the camera's powerful vision and the aestheticization of its resulting images that is precisely the work of the photographer. But in Lerma's story above, we see how his encounter with a corpse places this aestheticizing ability in crises. He sees the face of the corpse, drawing close to it with a mechanical eye of his camera. But what appears is not a mirror reflection of him. 
The camera instead reveals a sight that overwhelms his own. The face of the corpse turned towards him causes him to feel that he is dying. The fa- uh, it, it, it is as if he becomes a corpse himself. He experiences not a confirmation of his humanity, as he might, as he might uh, by looking at the face of someone living, but precisely its negation. Quote, I felt his last moments, how he died. He finds himself in the place of the victim being strangled and buried alive. Quote, losing all light and then all air. The corpse is the best and last witness to its death. But the sight of its face, conveyed by the camera, is such that it conjures in Lerma a fantasy of his own death. To see the agency of the corpse is thus to feel oneself on the verge of losing agency altogether. The camera, as an inhuman machine for registering pure appearances, cannot not see the corpse. It exposes the photographer to what he can no longer distinguish from himself. Not only does he become like the corpse, he also becomes like his camera. In both cases, he begins to feel as if, they were, as if he were losing what made him human. He is doubly captive to the inhuman power of the camera as it records the arrival of death in the body of the corpse and to the inhuman power of the corpse that shows him his own death. The only way he can break out of this double bind is to turn away from both. Quote, I didn't take any more photos like, like that if it's an extrajudicial killing. I don't focus my camera on faces of the corpses. One can take photos of the corpse's body, but not its face, insofar as it threatens to exp- expose one's own death. Doing so allows him to regain control of the mechanical eye and distance himself from the contaminating effects of the corpse's look. Now, Lerma subsumes the eye of the camera into his own eye while distancing himself from the powerful because impossible agency of the corpse. In this way, he would seem to regain his humanity from these two inhuman forces. But such a move is not sufficient to secure one's place as a witness. Something else is required, which entails identifying with the sorrow of the victim's families. And this is a pattern that you see with all the photographers. And this identification with the victim's families, of course, is part and parcel of the work of mourning. The photographer, in order to secure his humanity from the traumatic exposure to the dead, turns to the living survivors and joins them in their grief. Um, Such a turn is made possible by the photographer's harnessing of the camera's mechanical power. He converts the photographic image of the corpse from a horrific reminder of the individual's death to an icon of collective suffering and sacrifice. The corpse is reframed not just as a victim of state violence or as an envoy of one's own deadly fate. Rather, uh, it is reframed as a martyr destined for memorialization and devotion. To see this, let us turn to Rafi Lerma's second story, describing how he took what is probably his best known photograph and one of the the most iconic photographs of the drug war. I'm sure many of you have seen this, which President Duterte himself, during one of his State of the Nation address, took umbrage to, referring to it as, condescendingly as, the Pieta, right, the Pieta, a reference to the famous Michelangelo sculpture of Mary cradling the dead Christ in her arms. Now, I'm going to come back to this picture in a while, but first, uh, just a quick reminder of what the Pieta, for those of you who forgot what it looks like. Um, the story uh, of Lerma about taking this photograph is three parts, and, and let, me, let me quote it at length because it's really quite remarkable. Uh, here's the first part. I keep going back to the day, the day he took the photograph, uh, because even from afar, I could see it already. This was a picture. This was a picture. This is a very strong picture. It was the way she was holding Michael Sharon. She was cradling him. The first time I had seen anything like it, out in the open. In other crime scenes, there's always a crowd. But they, but they, that is, in this case, they were secluded, separated from the crowd because they were inside in the middle of the police cordon. Actually, it looked staged uh, because there were lots of television lights and they were in the center. But what is imprinted in my mind is Olyares screaming for help. I felt like we were vultures. She was screaming, help us, we need to bring him to the hospital. And we were there just clicking and clicking. And in fact, if you see some of the videos uh, of the coverage, uh, one of the most amazing sounds is the sound of the cameras going, right? Uh, keeps going. Uh, second part. As photojournalists, we're always looking for those strong pictures. We know these photos and would really, you know, we know these photos would really make an impact. And we have to take, and it's sad to say, it's really sad to say, we have to take advantage of it. 
and uh, but but as we uh, but but we just have to do our jobs, and our job is to share these pictures and convey their messages. All of us felt so heavy, but still, when we saw the photos, we thought, "Shit, this is strong." Third part. We went to the wake four days after, right? So there's the turn to mourn with the family. We went to the wake four days later. The first time they refused to let us in. But I saw a newspaper with my photo on the front page, so I took it in and I introduced myself to the father. Sir, I was the one who took that photo. So the photo becomes his entry card, right? I was the one who took the photo. And the father, Michael Sharon, said, oh, we've been waiting for you to come for some time. When I heard that, I felt lighter. He introduced me to Jenlyn Olyris. I told her I was sorry. Sorry that we behaved like that that night. Please understand what our work is. She didn't say anything, but she held my hand. And I guess she nodded, and she cried, and I think she got it. She saw the public reaction to the photo. I felt my heart was lighter. In the earlier story, right, Lerma relates being traumatized, right, when he sees the face of the corpse. He has a foretaste of his own death when seeing the face of the corpse. It is as if he looked at death in the face only to realize that his time had not yet arrived. It's like, whew, that could have been me, but thank goodness it wasn't me. So he escapes to tell the story of his fear and subsequent recovery of himself after literally facing its possible demise, right? So it's what some people would, would call a, a, an experience of the sublime, right? Because that's what the sublime experience is. You come close to a death-like experience and then you uh, escape it and then you live to tell its story. In the second story, it is not a matter of facing the corpse. Unlike the first story, the victim here is named Michael Sharon, and in other accounts, he is identified as a tricycle driver. When Lerma arrives at the scene, it is already cordoned off and spectacularly lighted, as if it were being staged. So here it is again. Even more important, the body of Sharon was being cradled by his partner, Jenlyn Olyris. The crime scene had already been set up, as it were. Its aestheticized appearance readily apparent to the photographer's eye. That's what he kept saying, it's a strong picture. Whatever menacing potential the corpse may have had was now safely contained both by the police cordon and the arms of Jenilin. So there's multiple mediations of the corpse, right? As is seen, its aesthetic qualities were already obvious and needed only to be recorded. How so? In other accounts of the story, Lerma, in fact, alludes to the scene as if it were a picture of the sculpture of the Pieta. And this is how the picture has come to be known, the famous picture of the Pieta. What makes this photograph so compelling is that the corpse uh, appears as if in the pose of a martyr. This is suggested by allusions to the dead Christ and, of course, saturated by a Filipino historical consciousness shot through with Christian narratives about martyred national heroes from Jose Rizal to Ninoy and Cory Aquino. Those of you familiar with Filipino history will know this. You cannot be a hero in the Philippines unless you are a martyr. You have to be shot. You have to be killed. Uh, heroes in the Philippines are never conquering heroes. Heroes in the Philippines have always been victimized and conquered, right? Because then they can be turned into martyrs that you can then pity and then mourn. Shot from a particular angle, it appears as if its abject body had been sacralized by death. Here's another angle of the same photograph. Other photographs of the victims similarly draw from this iconography of Christian martyrdom, showing them cradled by loved ones or mourned by family members. Here's one by Noel Salas. There's one. Or is this interesting because it's almost as if the, the light is coming from the face of the corpse. This one is almost like Caravaggio. And when I saw this, I thought, oh my God, you know, this is Renaissance. Right? And here's another one, right? Two different photographers. It looks like it's the same photographer, it's actually two different photographers. Others are shown laid out with their arms spread as if they were being crucified. Here's one. Another one. Uh, Another one, another one. In nearly all cases, the photographs are lighted in ways that bring out their chiaroscuro quality. The effect is to frame the victims and their survivors in a kind of sacred space, surrounded by darkness, while embraced by a halo of light reminiscent of Renaissance paintings. Now, in the Abrahamic tradition, martyrs are, of course, synonymous with witnesses. The word martyr itself comes from the Greek martus, which, quote, signifies a witness who testifies to a fact of which he has knowledge from personal observation. Martyrs are commemorated precisely as models of fidelity and courage. And their fidelity and courage comes from precisely bearing witness, right? So having a message to which they, they are willing to die for, as it were. 
Uh, the depictions of martyrs are integral to the designs of churches, starting with the crucified Christ in all his bloody glory. He had a famous one of, of uh, I think it's Mategna, right? And uh, uh, Grunewald, and many, many others you can go back to. But these images of death, meant to inspire the faithful, are all artfully rendered. Uh, and this is from a... Uh, book about uh, uh, Romania. Yeah, I, we were there last summer, so I, I thought I'd throw that in. Uh, what, whatever horrible death in particular uh, martyr may have suffered is softened uh, and shaped by colors and lines that lend them uh, a specific identity, distinguishing them from other angels and saints. To be devoted to such martyrs is to emulate, therefore, the power of their witnessing beyond death. Right? Now, by composing wittingly or unwittingly, and I think for the most part it's unwitting, right? It's unconscious that they do this. Photogra the photographs of cor corpses, uh, uh, by composing wittingly or unwittingly, the photographs of cor corpses as if they were martyred, surrounding or supplementing these with photos of their grieving survivors, photojournalists set up a kind of sacred tableau that tames the trauma induced by the crime scene. It turns the nightly occurrence of violence into a narrative of injustice directed at the poor by those who are powerful. Such photographs make legible death as sacrifice and the family suffering as, mourning, as, as a mourning designed to commemorate the dead. So it, again, it moves in the opposite direction as the police narratives, right, which doesn't see it as a sacrifice or murder, uh, but see it as a form of justice, right? But this moves in the opposite direction. We get a sense of the, con uh, of the conversion of the uncanny force of death into a narrative about martyrdom in the texts that accompany the photographs, either as captions or as more extended narratives. Such texts focus on the singularity of the victim, and I wish we had more time because we could go through the different write-ups of these photographs. It's very elaborate, very, very moving. Such texts focus on the singularity of the victim, beginning with its name, age, occupation, recounting its relationship to its family and community. Quote, I try to rebuild the person. I take the corpse and reimagine the man, close quote, says the journalist Patricia Evangelista. Laid out in a casket, a smiling picture of the person is usually placed on top while the corpse itself is made up to look like an image of itself while still alive. In this way, funeral wakes seek to recuperate a semblance of the dead's dignity, denied to it by its killers. Rather than trigger horror, the corpse on display instead stirs memories among the living, allowing them to tell stories apart from its murder. In this sense, are they remember? In this sense, are they redeemed? The fact that their deaths could be converted into a narrative of who they were, given a biography and so forth. In this sense, they are redeemed. Their humanity brought out by their victimization. In what amounts to a kind of secular hagiography, they are memorialized by journalists and by joining the family in mourning the dead. Photojournalists momentarily become related to the relations of the dead. Both are joined by a common witnessing that runs counter to Duterte's call for the victim's defacement. Now, attempts at rehumanizing the dead and the living, including the ranks of the photojournalists themselves. After all, this is not just about rehumanizing the survivors and the dead, it's also about rehumanizing the photographers themselves who have become traumatized, right? Uh, that these attempts are not always definitive. They are at best episodic and uneven. We get a sense of this if we turn to Lerma's story again, uh, that we looked at, the second one. Midway in the story, Lerma admits somewhat ruefully, quote, as photojournalists, we are always looking for those strong pictures. We know, what, we know these photos with, that would really make an impact, and we have to take, and it's sad to say, we have to take advantage of it. But we just have to do our jobs, and our job is to share these pictures and convey their messages. The photographer's job of sharing his or her pictures means making them available to a global market for images. This requires turning the photographs into images comparable to and substitutable for other images. Comparability and substitutability renders photographs into commodities exchangeable for money. What does this mean for photographs to circulate globally and take on the commodity form? As self-conscious witnesses to the crimes they cover, photojournalists participate in at least two kinds of economies. On the one hand, the moral economy of mourning that seeks to rehumanize the victims and their families against the dehumanizing force of the state. On the other hand, they participate in the capitalist economy that produces images for the global consumption of anonymous viewers. 
For photojournalists, their images are primarily meant to serve as documents of the war and evidence of the murderous workings of the state. But in, these, but in the aesthetic qualities of their photos lie a fundamental contradiction. On the one hand, the artistry of the images is meant to overcome the shock of encountering the dead and awaken the viewers to the truth of injustice. Uh, on the other hand, these aesthetic qualities are precisely what make them publishable to the extent that they attract the attention of a public who otherwise would remain oblivious to the grim realities of the war. Reaching such viewers requires that photos circulate globally. The circulation of photographs, however, can take at least two directions. One, it could circulate as entries for international awards and prizes. Or, two, it could circulate as image commodities for consumption in mass circulation media. What's the difference between these two? One way of gauging the global impact of, of these photographs is to no note uh, the uh, increasing amount of international recognition they have garnered since the start of the drug wars in July 2016. And the short film you saw was an example of that. And it won several prices and it gets distributed widely. They have been exhibited in museums and art fairs, discussed in university conferences, such as this one, uh, while photojournalists themselves have been awarded prizes ranging from Pulitzers, Magnums, Society of Publishers of Asia, the Overseas Press Club, so forth and so on. International awards can have a number of effects. They validate the photographer's skills and ethical commitment to truth-telling beyond the limited sites of their deployment. Awards serve to canonize their work, singling them out as exemplary depictions of, of extraordinary times. They are cited for their capacity to reframe what they reveal, the universal human condition that resides within even the most local of events. Through the photographs, the spatial and temporal particularity of the killings are thus acknowledged as ineluctable parts of larger ongoing crises of dehumanization across the world. It is this ability to signal the universal in the particular, to validate the ethical in the technical, and to recognize the moral in the political that constitutes the cult cultural authority of awards. For this reason, the international award system, if you can call it a system, the international award system is strategically positioned to counter the coercive and localizing power of the state to contain and erase these murders. Aside from these awards, however, there's also another more common way, because not everybody wins awards, right? Only a few do. What about those who don't win awards, right? So they have another way of circulating their images, much more common, which is by way of the global marketplace. And I think. For the majority of photojournalists who are not fortunate enough to win awards, staying employed is a precarious matter. Photographers have traditionally occupied the lowest rung in the hierarchy of professional journalism. Editors and writers usually enjoy a higher status with greater pay. Making things even more exploitive, photographers, at least in the Philippines, often do not retain copyright to the photos published in newspapers. Only those who freelance uh, can do this, and they have more control over their work, but they can barely make ends meet unless editors decide to use their photos. Hence, like other craftsmen, activists, and artists, the relationship of photojournalists to the market is as inescapable as it is highly contingent. Sitting uneasily beside the moral imperative of witnessing is the necessity of making a living by capturing and selling images of disasters and death. Indeed, without the marketplace, they would have no way to make public their images and thereby reveal the truth of what they see. This ambivalent re reliance on the market for circulating and publishing their images means that their attempts at rehumanization requires, ironically, a reliance on the non-human. Just as they depend on the mechanical eye of the camera, so they come to rely on the inhuman and arguably dehumanizing workings of capitalism and the consumerism it breeds. What then are the effects of the mass circulation of these photos? How does mass consumption mitigate and obscure the very truth that photographers wish to reveal? Photographers taking on the difficult assignments end up supplying what, again, James Siegel, to refer back to him again, refers to as the ever-expanding taste for images of disaster. It is a taste that is steadily cultivated and marketed in the vast media industries of Hollywood, for example, with endless films about extrajudicial killings, apocalyptic wars, and the slaughter of assorted aliens. That's why I hate watching Hollywood. In this sense, the labor of photographers, not only as 
uh, the, in this sense, the labor of the photographers not only has an emotional aspect, as seen in the trauma that many of them go through, it also has an inescapably commercial one. For this reason, attempts at rehumanizing both the corpses and themselves remain at best fragile and incomplete. By virtue of their conditions as workers and entrepreneurs, they are compelled to convert their photog photographs into commodities. The mass circulation of such photos has uneven and ambivalent effects. On the one hand, they expose different audiences, both local and international, to the horror that attends to the sight of corpses nightly laid out on the streets. Such images may initially produce revulsion, leaving viewers speechless in the face of what they see. On the other hand, anonymous viewers eventually come to think of these photos as photos, not as traces of people who were once alive. As photos, representations of the dead become substitutable with other photos of other dead or injured bodies in many other places and many other times. That is, they are subsumed as commodities exchangeable with other commodities. When we, whoever we are, consume photos in this fashion, as photos that are similar to and interchangeable with other photos by virtue of their exchange value, we as viewers begin to get over our initial shock. Though we may still feel disturbed every time we see them, the aesthetic quality of the photograph and, and the mediation of the marketplace tend to inoculate us from the trauma of witnessing the crime scenes. Likewise, we are spared the obligation of having to attend to the suffering of the survivors. At a distance from what we see, we can set aside the photos on our screen or newspaper and get on with our day by, for example, scrolling down to look at other kinds of images or simply moving on. We do not have to hear the piercing cries of the families, or at least can mute the sound in the videos, nor do we have to join in the extended work of mourning that at times escalate into larger calls for accountability. Rather than mourn, we consume. Soon enough, one corpse begins to look like any other, especially once these are composed artfully in photographs. Similarly, their families, drenched in their grief, now also begin to look like many other families in similar straits. As we saw, mourning entails the emergence of, of a collective sense of obligation to lay the dead to rest and shore up the line that divides the living from the dead. The conventions of mourning entail the work of restoring the integrity of society and the dignity of the individual. Consumption, by contrast, does away with this labor. Instead, consumers regard images in, of the dead in a state of distraction. Certain images may come across as arresting, provocative, even unbearable, but they are soon replaced by other images. Substitution here is mechanical, not the psychic process associated with mourning that entails considerable emotional investment. The singularity of the corpse while alive and the particularity of the family's conditions melt into the air of the marketplace. Commodification thus places photojournalists in a double bind. Their moral claims come to depend on an amoral process. Their photographs reach a wider audience, but at the cost of compromising their ethical and political commitments. Similarly, this commodification affects our ability to respond to these photographs. Once commodified, such images tend to habituate us to views of state violence, just as they would seem to normalize the sight of the corpses, making them seem passe. What is painful is converted into mere appearance, one image mechanically registered and consumed, soon to be replaced by another similar product. The novelty and shock, shock effect of photographed corpses soon wear off. As such, the potential of these photographs as critiques of official impunity are compromised by, even as it is contingent upon, their circulation as products for mass consumption. For just as aestheticizing the dead can rehumanize the victims by making them, to use Judith Butler's term, grievable, so too can it make for renewed indifference that forecloses the potential for political action. The global circulation of such images can also result in their overexposure, making what was once obscured into something obvious, ironically even easier to bury, uh, and ironically even easier to bury like the corpses they depict. So in this way, the, uh, the photographs, uh, as we've seen, and one of, one of the underlying arguments here is that the, the, the photographs and the corpses resemble one another, right? They trigger shock and induce mourning. But once they become representations, Right. Uh, photos also ensure the forgetting of the dead. Now, by way of conclusion, I want to bring up one more thing, which is the matter of haunting. How does the return of the dead uh, among the family of the victims differ from the return of the dead commemorated by the photographs? 
Right? There's two kinds of returns. I want to distinguish between the two. With so much death happening on a nightly basis, we might expect there to be a proliferation of ghosts as well as ghost stories. This is the case with the families of the victims. They often talk about expecting the spirit of the dead to return, usually three days after their death. They look toward the spirits coming back with great anticipation. Families want the spirit to reassure them that they are in a good state someplace else. For example, here is a story about Ricardo, who was killed in Pasay in the early part of 2017. There's a picture of a uh, wake. During his wake, Joy, his sister, waited for the feeling that Ericardo's ghost was with them. She posted on Facebook, of course, right, asking if anyone had had contact with Ericardo. No one. Uh, no one had. I was annoyed with him, she said. It had been six days and he still hadn't made himself felt. It wasn't until the day before his funeral that she felt him at a convenience store near the intersection where he worked, the last place where he was seen alive, climbing onto the back of someone's motorcycle. That night, Ericardo visited Joy in a dream. He was smiling, she said. Uh, when, he, when she consulted the local espiritista, an old woman who communes with the dead, the woman told her that Ericardo did not want the family to suffer. He wanted them to feel that he was still alive. It gave her comfort to know that Ericardo was not an angry spirit, lingering in this world, unable to accept his own death and demanding vengeance. It was just like him, Joy said. He was always easygoing. Still, one more dream Joy craves. I want to dream about the night he was killed, she said. I want to stab the person who stabbed him so I can finally defend him, even if it's just in her dreams. A dream of vengeance may be the nearest thing since Joy and others, uh, the Joy and others can hope for. Few of the killers are ever caught. And uh, here is Joy right there. Here the dead returns, and it's kind of interesting because it's a story about a family who lives uh, a family of squatters who live in the cemetery. So it's ironic that, you know, they deal with the dead in this way. Here the dead returns not to ask for something, but to fulfill the wishes of the living. In other contexts, uh, many, for example, Southeast Asian contexts, spirits usually return to possess the living, causing them to fall ill. Curers are then asked to speak with these spirits and give them a voice. Hence, do spirits often come across as, quote, desires without bodies. They come in search of a body to allow them to speak and fulfill their wishes. Once heard through the medium, the spirit leaves and the person possessed is cured of their illness. But in this context of the drug war, spirits come by way of dreams to assure those they left behind. The living thus look upon the spirit returns as benevolent rather than malevolent. Spirits come back to grant a simple wish, that of relieving the living of their worry as to the former's state in the afterlife. Spirit visitations are conventionalized in dreams and announced by local spiritistas. In this way, their arrivals are drained of anything uncanny. Rather than a symptom of trauma, the visit of spirits, like that of guests coming from abroad, generate expectations of comfort. Such a return helps complete the work of mourning and give the living the sense that the dead are truly dead, located in another and better place apart from the living. But while a dream about the spirit of the dead may alleviate the, grief, the, the grief of the living, it does not result in a sense of justice. As Joy's account shows, she wants to have another dream, not about Ericardo, but about, the, but about his killer. She wants to see what Ericardo saw, his own death at the hands of the murderer. Quote, I want to dream about the night he was killed. She says, I want to stab the person who stabbed him so I can finally defend him. Here, the living is left with a sense of lack. She wants what the dead no longer cares for, revenge. Her dream, she hopes, would let her become a witness to her brother's death. In this way, her dream acts as a kind of camera, allowing her to see the corpse as it registers the image of its killer at the moment of its death. Like the photojournalists who see their task as one of witnessing, Joy sees her dreaming as a way of seeking the truth about her brother's demise. For her, seeking vengeance would be a way to defend him, that is, to respond to his killing in kind. This is how she conceives of her obligation and her satisfaction, justice by way of revenge. In her world, where the poor have neither the means nor the energy to go through the legal system, much less file a case against those in power, dreams afford some measure of assurance and fantasies of justice in the form of revenge. Unlike photographs, however, her dreams do not lend themselves to commodification. They cannot be exchanged for money. Resistant to substitution, her dreams remains hers alone. 
Similarly, her brother's spirit escapes the pull of the capitalist marketplace and the violence of the state. It is not absorbed into the global realm of technological ghosts made up of other photographs, but returns only to his sister and perhaps to other members of the family. Coming from elsewhere, the dream pictures afforded by uh, the dead's return remain unseen and unseeable by us. Only joy sees them and holds them in reserve. That may not amount to much, but it is not nothing. It amounts to something, something perhaps impossible to calculate and command, something that President Duterte cannot kill, something that a camera cannot register, and something new neither you nor I can consume, much less appropriate. Thank you. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you, Vince. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm blocking you. No, but, no, um, so we um, we're, we'll have responses from three people. We haven't spoken about the order of response, so um, shall we just go one, two, three? Is that is that okay? Yeah. So um, let me let me introduce our speakers. First, we'll have uh, Veronica Pedroza. Uh, Veronica is an award-winning independent broadcast journalist based in London. She began her career in 1995 as a news anchor with CNN International and then with BBC World. Are you stopping me? I don't need to say any of this. I'll keep going. She's also been a journalist with ABS, CBN News and Current Affairs. And I will stop there, but I'll introduce all three of you first and go from one to the next if that's okay. All right. Uh, so then we'll, we'll have Dr. Fenella Cannell, who is a reader in social anthropology at LSE. She lived for two years in the Bicol region of the Philippines, and her book, Power and Intimacy in the Christian Philippines, won the Binda Prize for um, a monograph on Southeast Asia in 2001. And our last respondent will be John Seidel, who is professor of international and comparative politics, also at LSE. He's the author of Capital, Coercion, and Crime, Bossism in the Philippines, uh, the co-author of Philippine, Philippine Politics and Society in the 20th Century, Colonial Legacies, Postcolonial Trajectories, and perhaps I'll stop there with the Philippine-specific books, and um, I'll turn the microphone over to Veronica Pedrosa. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ashley, and thank you very much, Vince, for that um, amazing talk. Uh, so, yeah, I, the only reason I kind of interrupted was because I started my career actually in 1990 with ABS-CBN. Mm. Ah, okay, thank you. That's all right, with ABS-CBN, and then I went on to CNN, and then the BBC, then back to CNN in Hong Kong, and then uh, I've been with Al Jazeera English for the last 10 years, and, and then I became freelance, I kind of couldn't hack it anymore. Um, uh, because of many of the things that um, Vince talked about just then, actually, that um, just really quite difficult to stay, to keep one's humanity um, in the middle of covering a whole, a very um, uh, tumultuous time in Southeast Asia. And I moved back to London partly because I felt that I really wanted to live somewhere where I couldn't be put away or killed for something as um, minor as posting a f something on Facebook. I, I don't know what's happened to Southeast Asia. It's, you know, what happened in Malaysia, notwithstanding, um, a couple of days ago. Um, anyway, yes, um, my response to Vince would be um, to confirm question and um, deepen further some of the ideas that he brought up. Um, I was very um, taken by this idea of um, mediating, uh, viewing something as a human, as a journalist, for me also as somebody who was born in the Philippines but grew up in London and then went back to the Philippines as an international journalist because it's something that was quite, that uh, plays a very active part in the way that I tell stories. I need this to be as, um, this story to be as compelling to somebody in the Philippines who knows this story back to front, 
like Laf Rafi Lerma, as it is to somebody in London who knows nothing about what's going on. And what do you end up with when you've only got two minutes? Um, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that is very difficult to do. Um, and especially it depends on who you're working for. For CNN, ultimately, it's the shareholders. Yeah? In, um, for Jazeera, it's something altogether different. For the BBC, it's another altogether different thing. And as a freelancer, I wanted to tell a story about um, a, an experience that I had quite recently, which is that I wanted to get deeper into um, what had happened to the Rohingya who are on the uh, border of Bangladesh now, having fled from what some people are calling, and I believe to be, a genocide in Myanmar. And uh, I interviewed 15 people who had experienced a massacre in their village. Um, and their um, stories uh, seemed to build a picture that I thought corroborated each other. And then they sent me pictures of corpses. And I said, and these are people who said they were his father, that, I mean, they were the corpse's father or the corpse's brother or whatever. And they, they were sent uh, not just from people in the camp who had fled what had happened, but also people who were still in the massacre site, living in the massacre site or what remained of it. And when I sent it to an editor to try and sell the story for a fraction of what I'd actually spent on the story, <laughs> Um, they said, um, no, these pictures first appeared in September 2017. I went back to the people in the village and said, are you sure that's your son? And they said, yeah, absolutely. And it clearly wasn't. So I couldn't sell, sell my story to that output. They just said, the, these pictures are false. We don't know what else is false. And we don't have the time or the money to spend any more on this. And that's kind of happened in the Philippines, I think. Like Silla Rafi and Luis and all of those guys are saying that the editors are sick of seeing the same pictures over and over again. And they're like, as you say, um, they've become uh, forgettable. These images of these, the people have become forgettable as a result of the commodification. So I, I would like to say that, you know, my experience bears that out. Thank you. <laughs> because I've gotten a lot of grief from photojournalists for saying that. That's something that I wanted to bring up as well from, from photojournalists. So I went um, one night with the night crawlers, mm -hmm. and there are some of them whose names I will not mention here, because I know that they are, um, I don't, you didn't really bring it out, but they're under a lot of pressure politically. Um, uh, well, they're under a threat of, of their lives, um, as are many people who speak out against the extrajudicial killings. Can I take issue with your use of the term war? There is no war. There is no opposing side. Well, that's, that's the term that the state uses. Yeah, it's a term that it's, it, it is used. But I, I dislike it personally because there's, there's no other side. It's the same with the Rohingya. There's no other side. Mm -hmm. There's no one fighting back. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, so I, it's bravura. I, there was a sense of bravura and of camaraderie under fire. Nowadays, well, you used to be able to go to these um, crime scenes. Well, you, you sit in um, the Western Police District Station, well, I don't know what they call it now, Manila something or other. You know the one on mm -hmm. Padre Faura or something like that. You sit there and someone says, oh, the Soko van's going, the scene of the crime operation is going. So you jump in the Jeep that you've rented and you head off to Navotas or wherever it is, Malabon, and then you go and see the bodies and then you take the picture and then you go. But recently, the people who did the killings have been staying around and watching the police and watching the journalist when they first appear on the crime scene. And they're very menacing. They look back at the journalists and they are keeping an eye on who's taking the pictures. So the night crawlers um, have not, they're nowhere near as regular as they used to be. Now, nowadays I hear. No, no, it's yeah. dispersed. It, they've, they've, they have dispersed, yeah, yeah. Mm, 
there's also an extent to which uh, I might be busting a myth that the, the journalists, the night crawlers, even just naming them as the night crawlers, it's like, here's our posse. It's very barcada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is our posse. And that was borne out by an experience that my ex-husband had. My ex-husband was a CN, is a CNN cameraman. So he wasn't a night crawler. He was one of the parachuted in journalists like James Nutway. Yeah. It, yeah, James Nutway, whose yeah. images he used. Um, and he, and they, and he came almost to blows with them at a wake of one of these guys, one of these victims. Mm. Because they were like, wait a minute, who are you? Right. Right? And he's like, what you know and there was a little bit of friction there because there was this guy from cnn who had come in who hadn't paid his dues who wasn't part of the cartel and it's this, this cartel on information that happens with journalists in the philippines in particular yeah. that i think is quite an interesting phenomenon to look at if you're talking about journalism don't put that story out today the print guys are doing it tomorrow so let's sit on that one you know what I mean? Because they want to save it so that they can keep their jobs. Uh, things like that. Um, uh, I wanted to also bring up just um, uh, how the pictures are viewed nowadays. Like we look here on this big screen and you're down there and it's huge. And look at the way, looking at the way that the pictures are taken, that they're very much at eye level, at ground level, at corpse level. And, and the technology, I, want, I wanted to just add you know, your chiaroscuro um, observation. Cameras can do that nowadays in, the way, in a way that they couldn't do it. So you just buy a camera for, I don't know, a few hundred quid, and the blacks are intense, and you've got this cinematic feel over, with every image, and anyone can do it. It's amazing. So, and people are seeing them on smartphones. They're not necessarily seeing them on a screen, they're not opening a book, there's no journey to see them. That's another thing that makes it feel very disposable, I think, to me, and makes my, makes my witnessing of things feel a little contingent sometimes as well. <laughs> I actually spent a month living in Malabon, because, in, sorry, Navotas, because I wanted to um, counter what your observation was earlier, Vince, when you said that um, they only arrive after mm -hmm. the killing. I wanted to be there when something happened. Yeah, so that, and, and live it and see it and what it's like. And I, actually people there are very, you know, that thing, the, the, the cliche that people have about the Filipinos, that they're so resilient. Mm -hmm. They're so happy in spite of the poverty. Um, uh, and and, the, and they'd say, what they said, they said was, we never had justice anyway. Yeah. You know, what's, and by the way, we're on 12,000 dead now. It was not 7,000 anymore, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the latest figures are more like 20,000. <sighs> um, uh, and uh, I just tell a little anecdote to sort of supplement what you said, which is that there was, I met a guy who was involved in a sort of uh, mediation uh, consultancy thing. It's a Center for Humanitarian Diplomacy, or Dialogue, yeah, those guys. Uh, one of those guys, and, it, and he said that he, he read a story that day about an actor who was, he was being filmed doing a scene in one of those subdivisions in southern Manila, like Alabang or something like that. And the security guard thought it was for real that a crime was being carried out. So he shot the actor. Yeah? And he was not, and it was like, I mean, what do you do with that in court? And there were so many things wrong with that story on so many levels, and only in the Philippines type yeah, yeah. story. Um, but he felt that he was totally, you know, doing the right thing. That crim deserves to die. Mm. Yeah, got on his little motorbike, shot him dead. Thank you. Thank you. So Vince, yes. thank you. This has been amazing. Um, thank you very much, Rika. And I'm, uh, I, I can't tell you anything about uh, journalism in the Philippines. Uh, so I, I'm thinking about your extraordinary talk in relation to the whole range of your writings um, that I've known over now um, quite a number of years. And there are so many different things to say, but 
I'm going to ask you, I think, a series of, of, of stupid questions, and, and maybe you can give me um, intelligent answers to them, uh, because I, I can't answer them for myself. And one of the things I was thinking is how much you've written about the way that um, the, um, the resilience of Philippine history and Philippine culture has often revolved around assimilating the unassimilable um, and in making things that come uninvited from the outside into unlikely sources of value for the people who actually live um, in the Republic of the Philippines. And I wondered whether you've reached a kind of limit case here with uh, looking at Duterte's regime. You know, I wondered whether there is anything one can do with a leader who just shoots 20,000 of his own voters and citizens one after another, um, or any way in which uh, such, a, such a person could be converted into a source of value for others, a source of, of resistance or political mobilization by those whom he mistreats. And um, I, I wondered if your, your focus on the stopping of language uh, was part of a, um, a resonance there with your, with your wider range of arguments in which the capacity to, to use and um, repurpose and recreate language has been one of the sources of, of people's ability to continue in, in the accounts of work, uh, the accounts of the Philippines that you've given in your work. So here are some of my, my kind of silly questions. I mean, the stupidest question is, uh, what does this man think he's doing, right? I mean, I, I just wonder in what way he sees his own political project in your mind at the deepest level when, as you rightly pointed out, there is no way to really be a Philippine hero <laughs> except by being shot yourself, you know. Um, but obviously he's, he's operating in this alternate mode, you know, the mode not even of the strong man, the man with many followers, the man of power, the man of, 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 um, of admirable heroic might, but simply the man who just kills person after person after person. So maybe you can elucidate that for me. Um, that was one question. And another question was, well, what, who, who else is involved in the acts of mediation of these impossible assassinations? I mean, when I was living in Bicol, which is now a long time ago, I'm afraid, I spent quite a lot of time thinking about um, undertakers, mm. uh, you know, who came to um, villages all the time, and there were a lot of deaths where I was living, to um, embalm and prepare the corpse, and that, that act of um, spending money and also taking trouble is part of the way in which the living, the family, um, begin to make the division between the dead person who might come back and take you with them and the dead person who will come back and be the gift that stays in your memory as you stay in theirs, between a ghost and an ancestor. So I was thinking about the undertakers in your story who are both mediating and also commercially benefiting from in a, in a different register than the photographers and obviously less in an international arena. Um, and then what was the final thing I wanted to say? There was just, uh, just one more, I think. I think I've lost track of it with my own handwriting. Hang on. Um, Yeah. So um, that was um, that was the second question, and uh, then the third question was about um, who is being addressed in these acts and um, who the audiences are for uh, for these different kinds of acts of communication or failed communication. And, you know, in a sense, the, the um, commoditization of photographs, you could see it as um, acts of communication that are, that are looking for an audience. They're looking for an addressee. But the addressee appears to be entirely missing if we're looking for someone to, to respond in the language of international justice, uh, at least. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I wondered also about the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the people who were killed, because I was thinking about the famous case of those who were buried in the construction of Imelda Marcos's cultural center, and how the, the people who 
were wrongly buried, were not buried by their families, but were trapped in concrete, became ghosts who wouldn't leave Imelda alone. Um, and yet these people, they return to their families, and you thought of them as, in a way, ancestors, people whose relationship with the living had been resolved. I wondered why they weren't all haunting Duterte. Uh, and <laughs> you know, whether there's any, you know, in the past there's sometimes been um, little political movements, even tiny little provincial ones, which have begun around a particular spiritista or medium, a part of whose um, capacity to communicate is across the boundary between the dead and the living. Yeah. And I wondered whether you saw any of that kind of micro-political um, action and framing um, in the encounters and locations where, where you've been. I, I haven't, but that's a great idea. And I think that's the future of organizing, is to organize all these spiritistas, spiritistas and make Ula and, and haunt him. I mean, really. Because I think he would respond to that. He might just respond to that. Do you want to take off some No, that's just, uh, just we, we can just yeah. go around and then maybe have the audience also respond. So, John? Sure. Uh, yeah, as, as usual, there is uh, an enormous amount in Vince's talk to uh, think about and comment on. I, I guess for me, what, what struck me uh, as I was watching was this uh, returning sense of discomfort um, at the prospect of having to comment on, <laughs> um, uh, especially a, a, as a foreigner, who an American who, who travels frequently to the Philippines in comfort and security. Um, but but to comment on Duterte and on this kind of politics in a way that doesn't, you know, uh, fall into the trap of reinforcing and amplifying the kind of power that Duterte. Uh, exercises and and as with say Donald Trump for example th this excessive attention to the individual um, and a focus on the personality uh, and the personal kinds of power that are uh, are exerted by such individuals it's it, there's something uh, that I find kind of uh, sort of re revulsive and uh, very unappealing and and you know sort of complicit in, in talking about it. And clearly to get to Fenella's question about Duterte's uh, motivation or intentionality here, I think part of it must be that in this role as president and as master killer um, in the Philippines, he's enjoying, that. there's a sense of, of pleasure in enjoying that haunting that, that we saw in, in the first film, you know, and that you uh, revisited. And therefore, Obviously, when you think of the role of journalists um, and of photojournalists and of documentary films in revisiting and amplifying that, there's the danger of amplifying the fear and amplifying the power um, that comes with that. And so what do you do against that? And sort of analytically, as an academic, you can step back and say, well, you know, I'm sorry, but I've been in and out of the Philippines since the 1980s, and as far as I can remember, there have always been, you know, uh, people killed like this. Um, it's happened under both Aquino presidencies. It happened under Ramos. It happened under uh, Macabagal. It happened under Estrada. This is part of the repertoire of Philippine politics. And, you know, it's a set of contingent circumstances that have elevated this to a, a national kind of policy and, and a sort of signature style and substance of, of, of this presidency. Um, so that's one sort of historicization to sort of pull it away from Duterte. And another way that journalists can engage in was that, that piece you sent me months ago by Reuters, where they systematically looked at one uh, district uh, within Quezon City and sort of mapped out, you know, what areas of Quezon City Literally, there's you know beautiful sort of 21st century you know uh, multimedia presentation of mapping and gridding, and also looking at the individual policemen whose whose presence on the scene was sort of you know correlates closely with these killings and so forth, and you can sort of analyze it that way. Um, but it seemed to me that early on in your presentation, when you, you talked about the about the uh, the disappearance of the social. You know, that, that that was really crucial because it seems to me 
you know, if you go back to the, the mid-late 1980s, which is when Duterte emerged in a city notable for the intensity of the revolutionary mobilization that unfolded in the period leading up to the overthrow of Marcos, uh, the Welgung Bayan, the, the, the left-wing, broad, popular forms of mobilization in the city. And then after Marcos fell with strong American involvement, um, the brutal anti-communist hysteria and uh, vigilante mobilization and counterinsurgency that unfolded, that part of what was made to disappear was the social, the notion of Philippine society, all those people who were there in, on EDSA or who were in different ways mobilizing to represent Philippine society as social forces, as workers, as peasants, as youth, as men, as women, as the poor, um, they disappeared in favor of newspapers and TV shows and representations in which society disappeared and individual politicians and personalities took their place. And, and I think what was actually quite moving in what you uh, showed us was the return of the social in the funerals. In the funerals. When you can, and when you can see there are still vibrant, as you discovered, neighborhoods where people are there as members of society and families and communities. And, 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 and in that we see, you know, as against, you know, what we see in terms of terrorism uh, today, not just the perpetrators and the pathologies of these these perpetrators, but you know the victims, the families um, uh, out there, and that is, I think, perhaps along with the church, after all these years, yeah. the seeds of a basis of of some kind of renewal and some kind of effort to re-represent Philippine society mm -hmm. in the face of what's become so hegemonic as an understanding of Philippine politics and a Philippine life in which, you know, representation is articulated in, in this particularly narrow and deeply conservative way. Mm -hmm. So I think that provided yeah. seeds of hope, uh, it, to my mind, amidst all the horror. Did you want to jump in? I just wanted to take out one of the points that you made, John, about um, be, because my understanding is that the so-called war on drugs is being used as a political tool against local politicians by the central government, Duterte administration, and that um, officials on every level of government are complicit in the growing so-called war on drugs. Um, for example, Quezon City declared itself to be a drug, we want to be a drug-free zone. In other words, that was a declaration of fealty to the Duterte administration. And those that don't, like in Metro Manila, that's what I know best, in Makati, um, for example, the mayor there will not declare Makati a drug-free zone because it means they're not gonna go along with it. And that means that they may lose out on federal funds. I mean, not federal funds, what are they called? National funds, mm -hmm. central funds. Um, which is a pretty interesting kind of side that isn't um, brought out in the chiaroscuro of the artistic photograph. Maybe we should see if the audience has yeah. any yeah. questions. And... Yeah. yeah, Gina. Um,
that are de dealing with addiction and pushers. <coughs> I don't but but just, just just a very quick response to that. Yeah. In fact, that's that's what people thought. So they some of the people, especially in Baklaran Church, they started exhibiting these photographs, yeah. putting them on tarps. And so I, I, when I heard about this, so I went over to Baklaran, and I was looking at people there, and people just ignored it. They walked right past it. There were l lovers who were sitting there, making small talk, beside a photograph of a, of, a, of, a, of a dead corpse. And so forth. And so I was wondering, what's going on? Why, why aren't they like moved like we are? And then, of course, you realize that the we here is different, right? Um, and then, and then I also ta I was talking to um, uh, Oliver uh, de Guzman, who's, who's been covering a lot of this stuff. Orlando, 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 Orlando de Guzman is covering a lot of this stuff. He's, he's making a documentary right now. So I asked him the same thing: Aren't people like weirded out? Walking by the alley where there's been a killing, or in the side in the street the streets where there's been a killing, he said, "You know what? They don't really seem to mind. It just goes out of their minds." Like the other day, uh, he was saying that he was somewhere in Kalookan or someplace, and they had had a killing the night before, and and there were still traces of blood on the street. And here come the kids, and they're sitting there waiting for the school bus to come. Nobody says anything. Nobody says, you know. I mean, in, in other words, it, it seems like uh, places which you think would be haunted, places which you think would be permeated by fear, are sort of like, baliwala. You know what I mean? And I think part of it is the belief among most people, not all, but most people that, well, if they die, they deserve to die. Can I, can I, I'm, I'm, um, this is a very naive question, but perhaps following up on what some of you were saying as well, it struck me in that uh, in a number of ways the photojournalists could be seen. I was surprised to hear you say that they are uh, how much under threat they are, the night crawlers, right? Because it struck me that they could so easily be seen in many ways as playing the game, as promoting, as promoting, I mean, in some ways that you pointed out, right, that, that they are. They're well, they're circulating these these photographs for free, right? Of of um, to scare pe that scares people, right. right? The faceless. That's right. Um, they are also, you know, as we all do, as you were pointing out, we play up Trump um, through our obsession, right. um, and that that way in which they are a part of it seems to me to be. Well, so the, the one thing that seemed to me to be really crucially distinguishing it is the photographs of the mourners. So the body plus the mourners, but the photographs of the bodies per se, yeah. uh, in absence of the, the, the broader social context beyond the, the, the asphalt, um, that seems to me to be really problematic. And That's right. yeah. it could easily be folded into propaganda. Propaganda for the state. This is what the so, state is which is, I suppose, coming back to what you were saying, Gina, as well, that how how do we know, right? We're we're living in a very different moment from the Vietnam War and from the aftermath of the Vietnam War. A very very different moment vis-à-vis -vis media. And how can we say that this photograph is not perpetuating uh, more than it is contradicting and countering and with a, a, a future um, vocation of that order? With the exception, perhaps, of the inclusion of the social, that seems to me to be an important yeah. distinction. And I actually so. have some, something to say about that too. But first, maybe we can get some more, get some more questions. Yeah, Jovi. Yeah. Marcus, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned two ways that they could modify, um, you know, these images. Yeah. And uh, you, you neglected to mention uh, the third way, which is via social media, Instagram, and mm. Facebook, and Twitter, and like the fact that. Like everyone is a publisher these days. One thing that we talk about in, in media is that like, right. you know, we're no longer the the, the uh, you know end all and be all or gatekeepers for anything really. You know, in, in a lot of ways. So a lot of the yeah. can yeah. be built yeah. up outside of the outside of the system. And that's both scary <laughs> and, and both hopeful in some ways because um, it also allows people to react and to popularize things. But, you know, it's just, it's a very complex and new kind of, like, 
media environment, and mm -hmm. I wondered if you had given that much thought. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I, I should I should think about because I'm not on Instagram, so I should I should probably <laughs> join join Instagram and think about. It. But it, it gives rise to this idea of 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 a third way, which is curate cur curatorship. Yeah. Individual ph phot photographers, in fact, do this. They curate their work stuff that doesn't get used by their editors, they put on their Instagram, and then you can look through them. And of course, they have their followers and so forth. Uh, but what happens to that is it's a little bit like, like all curatorships. You, you exhibit them, right? And then you ask, well, what's the exhibition, exhibition value of these photographs? Well, they're nicely done. Um, maybe they trigger moral outrage, or maybe they push an argument, right? But in and of themselves, and this is the bottom line, in and of themselves, photographs cannot change policy. Photographs will not stop the killing. Everybody knows this. Every, the photographers themselves know this, right? So you can curate and you can have as many Instagram things as you want and it might alleviate your conscience. You might think, well, I'm putting this on as testimonies, as documents for future. But in and of themselves, unless it's connected with something else, for example, actual legislation, social movements, the return of the social photographs, uh, I think, uh, are very, very fragile that way. Right? Yeah. Yes, and, and then Kenny, yeah. I, I mean, yes, uh, 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 Edwin, is it? Um, Eric, Eric, I'm sorry. Uh, there was this um, story uh, by the Daniel Yeah, yeah, the New York Times guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who didn't like this paper, by the way? And uh, you know, the, you know, one of these might fall into yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Script that they did. Uh, to, they went to Parola in Tondo, and uh, in fact, he, he saw it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and then uh, people were, you know, it was a typical day, and people yeah. were coming out of their houses, bringing <coughs> their maps There's, there's several of those. Pat Patricia Evangelista and Carlo Gabuco have been putting out the Impunity Chronicles. Uh, they've been coming out in Rappler. There's, there's several of them. They've won lots and lots of prizes. That's exactly what they've been doing. They spend a lot of time with the victims. They interview the families. I, 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 as Patricia says, you know, I try to build the man from the corpse, right, and sort of reverse the process of, of, of murder. So there are many of those. But guess what? They haven't made a difference. The killings still continue. The third that doesn't give a fuck. It's as simple as that. The police don't care. And most tragically, the people in the neighborhoods themselves don't seem to be perturbed at all. They see it as tragic, too bad, but that's good. 
you know, today, it at least we feel safer. You know, those guys that used to like hassle us when we went to the sorry, sorry store, they're gone. You know, uh, I would come home with my CCTs and sometimes they would take my CCTs with me and now they're all gone. So it's okay, I feel safe. Right? And so you have this bizarre situation of what obviously looks like an incredibly sort of murderous regime is met by and large with approval. I mean, there are, of course, families who uh, are hurting and so forth. You know, my favorite story is, is, is this mother, and I'm sure some of you have heard of this. She has two sons. One son gets killed, the other goes free. And she's grieving. And when they ask her, what are you grieving about? She said, well, they killed the good son. He was the one who was going to college and was going to work. The other son was a drug addict. They should have just gotten him. So in her mind, there's a particular kind of economy of substitution. I don't mind the bad guy getting killed, but I want my son, the good son, to, be, to stay alive. Right? That, for her, is a sense of justice. If she feels that there's been an injustice done, that's the, inju that's the level in which she feels the injustice has been done. Not this larger thing about how, oh, innocent people are being killed without getting due process. Because as we know, due process is a very abstract and difficult concept uh, for most people to get. So for them, killing is, this is justice. This is expeditious. You get rid of the dregs, right? Uh, are they really dregs? Well, we don't have to bother with that. Those are details. So. Yes? Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. I just had a few comments to make. I'm a follower of the Nightwood guys. Uh huh. In 2016. Yes. I'm very represented. Oh, okay. Are you a photographer yourself? No, a filmmaker. A filmmaker, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I see, I see.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Gina. Yeah, um, you made some good point in response to Archie's point. Mm -hmm. It's true. Photographs are captures of precise moment. But over time, it's the viewer that will change perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah? So whoever views this photograph will find a truth it's true. Yeah. in that yeah. photograph. Yeah. And for that, I really think that these repulsive pho photographs will offer a truth in time. That's over the hope. Time, yeah, that's the hope. Right? Yeah. So we do live in very different times from the Vietnam War, but those people that saw those pictures at the time they were taken is different from the way people see it now. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we still don't agree that it was the right thing to do. There will always be <coughs> dissent on whoever is viewing the image, mm -hmm. but overall, I think the truth will surface from the precision of mm -hmm. that image that was taken. Yeah, I, th I think that's the whole candy. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I was uh, a, a junior photographer uh, during the Marcos era, yeah. uh, the old grizzled guys used to say, if you see the, the photo, you didn't take it because of the shutter coming down. So right. you saw the moment that uh -huh. you wanted to shoot, uh -huh. you didn't get the shot. Yeah. But yeah. What I wanted so it's to the opposite of, of, yeah. of his point. Yeah. <laughs> That's very I, was gonna, yeah. I was gonna yeah. just make a, I was really struck by the difference between that time, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> when I was a young journalist in the Marcus era, and this, uh, the, the, the narration you just yeah. gave us. Yeah. Um, in, in the Marcus era, in the 1980s, mm. when there was no social media, right. and no ubiquity of photography, and no easily um, manipulated photography, and there was a lot more trust in, because it, take, it took skill to produce a photograph, put it on a piece of paper, and disseminate it. Sure, sure. Um, the impact of photography uh, during the Marcos era was part of what brought him down. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was also a, a very different attitude towards the photographs. The more, because I worked for a magazine which was bizarrely called Mr. and Ms. Yeah, yeah, of course. Which, yeah. which documented the, 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 yeah. And um, these photographers, uh, Lucas Luana was one of them, the guy who made the film, yeah. would walk into the room, my job was to take the photographs and put them, and, and we, we just have spreads and spreads and spreads of rallies, uh, uh, you know, terrible photos, good photos, protests mm -hmm. against Marcos. And that, and that, that sold hundreds of, and thousands of copies of mm -hmm. our magazine mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. The reason, my, my editor said, the reason is probably because people like seeing themselves in, mm -hmm. in newspapers. They Could like be. seeing the photos. That the more be. they saw of themselves, and they identified with yeah. the crowds of people protesting, uh -huh, uh -huh. the more they saw of themselves, the more they participated right. in the protest right. against Marcos. Right. And the opposite is happening today, because yeah. people are, what's the word, they're oversaturated with information. Yeah. From yeah. Facebook and Instagram and all those photographs, yeah, yeah. you've seen too many photographs. Yeah. It wasn't like in the olden days where you had to buy it, yeah. buy it to see it. And yeah. you looked in the crowd, the crowd photos we published, the crowd photos in full spreads because we knew that the people buying the newspapers would search for themselves through those tiny heads. Right, right, right. Um, but now people have right. this uh, right. sense of First of all, they're happening in these communities which have always, always been ignored, which right. have always suffered that kind of justice. Yeah. It's nothing new to them. Exactly. Being shot in their beds, that's nothing new. It's just that it's, it's the government that's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and then there's this other thing that's also happening where I'd rather that wasn't me. Yeah. Um, exactly. And so they are not participating. They don't have that kind of revulsion and anger, perhaps. Perhaps they do, but they're not showing it. But they're not, it's not like the way it swept people in, during the Marcus era, the photographs swept people yeah. into, into the streets. Yeah. This is driving them in because they're saying, no, that's not me, I'm not about that. Right, right. That is, this, this exactly, right. Not exactly. Me. Yeah, that, that's a really, really interesting way of historicizing the reception of the photographs. That it, it, in, a, in another context, this sort of identification with the photograph. In this context, there's a disidentification with the photograph. In one context, it stimulates the emergence of a new social. In this case, it, it deracinates it. It continues that, that sense of deracinate. And, and, and I suspect 
you know, because I have a much longer version of this paper, the first half, where I talk about the, 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 how the drug war is connected to contractualization, to OFWs, to uh, call centers. In other words, all, th th there's an entire neoliberal economy uh, that, that in some ways informs the way these, these killings are killed out and the way they're received. Uh, it's very important to remember that uh, the killings are financialized quite handsomely. Mm -hmm. So cops are rewarded for every kill they make. Funeral parlors benefit and profit from the dead that's delivered. Um, and uh, the drug money, uh, the, drug, the drug trade, in fact, continues to prosper rather than to, rather than to fall apart because the targets have been uh, these poor people rather than the drug lords themselves. So there's a way in which the killings are actually part of a much larger economy. Uh, very, very profitable for some people uh, that produce all of these things. So, so that may be, too, why the, the photographs uh, tend to, perhaps this is what's going on, they, the, the, the photographers bring with them a kind of hope and a kind of ideology that's from an earlier era that somehow hasn't come to terms with the different conditions, radically different conditions, of the way in which people view and receive and circulate these photographs, alongside living in different, entirely different ways of life. Right? So that may be what's going on. Perhaps it's also the nature of the photograph. Because one of the yeah. things that we also noticed in that magazine was yeah. we, we also had some really horrendous photos of um, military abuses in the in the countryside, right. so you know, right. pictures of children with their bodies split up, uh, yeah. chomped up by, yeah. Yeah. by military people just trying to stop them from right. collaborating with uh, communist insurgency. Right. And, right. Um, and when we publish kind of really, really sensitive photos like that, there isn't the kind of reaction that we get. That we get, you know, people are upset. sorry for them maybe, yeah. but they, they don't have a strong reaction in the way that you might find in the West if you saw them. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yes, yes, and then yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted yeah. To, yeah, I just wanted to comment on the social impact of the reception of the photographs mm -hmm. because you have to note that people are not experiencing them in a vacuum. There are other narratives being put forward by, you know, let's say state propagandists mm -hmm. or just right. amateur uh, amateur supporters who actually have counter narratives to what the photographs are saying. So even before the photographs come out, you already have sometimes sort of poorly worded, you know, Facebook posts saying that that person was a criminal under the this person yeah. was a criminal, so the truth yeah. is often obscured by these sort of narratives. And the, the other comment I had with regards to that is that sort of the contrast between the professionalism and the beauty of these photos are often um, they're often brushed aside for very amateurish sort of memes and iconography that support of the state, and it's almost as if sort of the professionals are being are not being rewarded. You're actually being penalized for being slightly like professional because there's a narrative that says the people who are good at their jobs, the journalists and the human rights activists and the academics, are actually spreading lies, and it's us who are amateurs who do sort of these very rough um, statements who are telling the truth. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. raise that as a point for discussion, especially with regards mm -hmm. to how change can happen when these two narratives or these two points of view really clash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody else? Yes, the person in the back. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, in 2004, I was assisted at the time military in Thailand, and we were on the back of a lorry, and we were funneled uh, in a roadblock. And as we went, we, we looked right through, and as we went through the roadblock, mm -hmm. uh, I noticed there were three dead bodies on the side of the road, and made my arse. And we just told that this was uh, Prime Minister Taxi's mm -hmm. war on drugs mm -hmm. in 2000. Around about 2004, and uh, it, unless I kind of miss something, there doesn't seem to be as much exposure with taxing and the, the thousands that he uh, saw executed as there seems to be here in the Philippines. And that was my first uh, point. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder why that was, and, and I wonder whether that was because the reason I was there was uh, humanitarian in retrieving mm -hmm. uh, corpses because of the tsunami at uh, the same time. So I ended up randomly, not from choice, as head of security. Um, in a morgue, and that was to stop photojournalists from taking pictures mm. of the corpses that would get into the newspapers because it was early days of social media. And it was a, uh, it was a, uh, an awful job really stopping photojournalists because I think the concern was there was Europeans in there, and, and there seemed to be more value placed on the Europeans and those being exposed. Someone finding out that's my loved one long before they find out officially. And um, so it was a 
thankless task in, in, in Scotland. But the photojournalists just didn't give up. They did not give up. You know, they found a good trick in the book to get by. Um, they not, they, it was a, it was a sorry, it was pointless as well because the, the lenses they, they were too mm. far back for me to stop them anyway. Mm -hmm. Getting pictures of the, the corpses that were stored behind mm -hmm. me. But, um, so, yeah, I just wonder really uh, this reflection on um, why, why there wasn't as much exposure to war and drugs in Thailand as there has been in the Philippines, unless I've missed it. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yes, Cindy. Hi. So, uh, I've got a comment and then I've got a question that's probably related to what you know, we've talked about. Um, I love your talk and I would really love to read the rest of your paper. Uh, and, and what I want to say is better uh, said by somebody else who is much smarter and who's actually uh, written a book about it. Uh, I'm sure you've read the book of Susan Swan, Harry Wong, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah, others. Yeah, of course. I've always had problems with particularly with the aesthetization of, 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 of the people who have been killed in the Civil War. Right. I, 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 I know a lot of the photographers that like, took these images. And, um, let me just read this and then, and then I'll, let me ask the, the question. Let me put the question to the panel. That we are not totally transformed, that we, that we can turn away, turn the page, switch the, ta switch the channel, does not impugn the ethical value of an assault by images. It is not the defect that we are not seared, that we do not suffer enough when we see these images. Neither is the photograph supposed to repair our ignorance about the history and causes of the suffering it picks out and frames. Such images cannot be more than an invitation to pay attention, to reflect, to learn, to examine the, rational, the rationalizations for mass suffering offered by established powers. All this with the understanding that moral indignation, like compassion, cannot dictate the course of action. Um, you mentioned earlier about the... Was, it, was that Susan Sontag? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it, 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 yeah. Uh, and you mentioned earlier about the economy of photographs and how they operate on a moral and, and yeah. passive level. I'd like to pose a question to yeah. the panel. No, my, my, my quick answer to that is to say that uh, the photographs are most powerful when they're connected to, as Eric was saying, to larger narratives. Uh, for example, these photographs have been used by Human Rights Report, by Amnesty International. Uh, I'm sure they're being looked at by the ICC as they are you're beginning to investigate Duterte. So that's one aspect of it. And I think that's part of the internet, what I've been calling the international awards system, right? Where you have the outside world that sees these photographs uh, and uses them to build a case against the regime uh, and to come to terms with, with uh, to, sort of to, 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 construct, to construct this narrative. Um, I think historians will find these photographs extremely valuable, uh, as they have with every sort of depictions of atrocities in various places, as a way of supplementing and amplifying uh, certain kinds of arguments they want to make uh, about a particular event. Uh, so in that sense, they, they're valuable as repositories of a particular event, of a particular moment, they're, they're, each photograph is an archive of some sort. And like all archives, they have to be unearthed, they have to be uh, sort of excavated, uh, uh, but, but they also have to sort of quote unquote come alive. And their way of coming alive is precisely by being attached to a narrative, even if it's just a caption. This is, this is a photograph of so-and-so who was killed at such and such by so-and-so, right? W once you begin to caption it, you begin to frame it, uh, and, and, and you can see this in, I mean, Judith Butler has this interesting argument with Susan Sontag. I mean, this is what she, uh, she this is how she argues against Susan Sontag, is because Sontag uh, forgets that photographs are already framed, uh, and they in turn allow you to frame events. So there's this whole series of frames uh, that, that allow, allow uh, for example, for you to enter into a kind of intimate relationship with, with the subjects of those photographs. So yeah, that would be my quick answer to that.
We should probably take one more question or so. Yeah, one and two. Yeah, yeah. Raphael, and then somebody in the back. Yeah. And last, last question. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. Um, this is the justice that I want. And so it actually perhaps even supports the very narrative mm -hmm. that they already have. Because it's just that it seems like these photographs are um, further causing divide. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. 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 I think we're done, right? We're running out of time. I, 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 we're not done. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. Not done. I'm, I'm, I'm watching the time. We will interrupt until next time. So um, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Vance. Thank you. Thanks, and thank you to thank our you. panel members yeah. and all of you as yeah. well. Yeah.